Welcome to a Climate Conversation podcast. This is a podcast series that is a complement to the film, the documentary, A Climate Conversation. And uh, it's just these important discussions about climate and this whole narrative out there. Uh, it began, it's the brainchild of Walt Johnson. He is a geophysicist, has been in the business for 50 years. He and his wife personally stepped forward to have this documentary made. And Walt Johnson, this conversation is so important. Thank you very much, Kim. And it's because of all the contribution of everyone else that made it so good. But thank you. And Dave O'Rourke, a spokesperson for Jen, you and I are both learning so much through all these podcasts. We're learning from the podcast. And, and, and uh, you know, just let me shamelessly plug the, the book that will be at the heart of this one, because I learned more in the last couple of weeks reading this book than I knew cumulatively previously. And it, it it's just it's, I think we're going to have a terrific podcast today. I'm really excited about it. Well, and we're excited that our guest is Dr. David Legates. He is with the Cornwall Alliance for the Stewardship of Creation. And he is the author of a very important book. It's uh, the number one book on energy policy at Amazon, and it's Climate and Energy, The Case for Realism. Uh, Dr. Legates, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me here. And why did you choose the word realism in the title of your book? Well, the interesting thing is, if you remember back, oh, 20, 30 years ago, CNN used to have a show called Crossfire. And on that show, you'd have one person on one extreme, you'd have the other person on the other extreme, and they'd scream at each other for about an hour, and then you'd call it entertainment. But the problem is nothing ever got settled because nobody follows either of those extremes. In climate change, what we have our climate alarmists who believe that unless we change the way our economy is doing working in the next two, three, four years, that we're going to hit a tipping point. And the next thing you know, climate is going to be out of control. The earth is going to head towards a fireball. Uh, so we have to do everything we can to stop it. On the other hand, we have people that believe climate doesn't change. Climate remains constant. There's no way that anything affects climate. And we decided to call this realism because the real truth is somewhere in between. Humans can affect our climate. Climate does change. On the other hand, the climate change we're seeing is not going to be draconian. It's not going to be the end of the world, and it's probably going to be good. So the case for realism is the case that it, even though it's changing, it probably is going to be a better world for it. Well, and Dave, uh, in reading the book, I know that you have learned a lot. What's one of the first things that you'd like Dr. Legates to, to talk about? Well, I think it's if, if we could just expand on, on this crossfire concept, which implies that there's there's some equality, some balance, that I have a point of view, you have an opposing point of view, you know, we'll settle on policy and come to some sort of compromise. This is not that. This is a Jacobian exercise in chopping heads off uh, and canceling people and ruining careers and canceling, you know, research grants. And, you know, th this is hard ball on a trillion dollar scale. And yet we're told that the scientists are all in complete consensus, except for a lunatic fringe of 3% or so. Uh, I've read your book and I think, uh, I, I, now I know, you know, so lights come on. Can we talk a little bit about this idea of consensus and whether or not that's a word that should be applied inside the scientific method in any context? Certainly. I mean, that that was one of the issues that, that came up when, I, you know, several years ago was the idea that somehow everybody is in one camp, that 97 percent of scientists agree and that there's 3 percent. The reason the 3 percent number comes around is actually there's a 3 percent rule that exists. Uh, if it's too small of a number, you're going to believe that, well, I, how come I know people that believe this differently? On the other hand, if it's 50-50, well, then it's a debate and we need to get into the argument. The problem is this is a topic that is not just simply esoteric. It's not like does string theory exist or does do things uh, assemble a different way? Whatever answer we come up with that way is not going to affect your life, not going to affect your economy. 
this will, because if we're destroying the environment, then essentially we've got to do something to stop it. But do we need to do major things to stop it? Because maybe it's not being destroyed. So we really have to come up with a correct answer to that. Now, the idea is that the first time this came out, it was a, an article in Nature, I believe, by Naomi Oreskes. And she literally proclaimed 100% of all the scientists that, uh, that exist doing climate science work believe that climate change is human-induced and disastrous. The problem, of course, with the 100% rule is that all I have to do is find one person and your number's broken. And so that's later what they came back with and why they came up with this 97%. But the, the weird thing is it's the way you ask the question. In other words, if I were to say to you, do you believe in UFOs? Think about that question for a moment. Do UFOs exist? Well, if you and I went out into Denver or San Francisco or wherever we live and we look up in the sky and we see something moving across the sky, it's an unidentified to us uh, move flying object. So it's a UFO. Now, it could be a plane headed into Denver International Airport. It could be swamp gas. It could be an international space station. It could be somebody's drone that they're playing with at night. It could be aliens from outer space. But the question I ask is, do you believe there are, uh, uh, there are uh, UFOs, unidentified flying objects? The answer, therefore, is yes, but they may be identifiable and they may make sense. The question I didn't ask is, do you believe UFOs are aliens coming in from other planets? And coming back to the climate argument, that's the exact same question. People will ask, do you believe climate change exists? And I don't know why 100% of the world doesn't say yes, because climate has never remained constant. Climate is always variable. Now, the question is, why does it vary? Is it natural processes? Yes. Is it human processes? Yes. Okay. What kind of climate change are we seeing? Is it disastrous? What's causing it? That is not well into the question, Does uh, do you believe in climate change? And the interesting thing is the American Meteorological Society, oh, I guess it was about eight or nine years ago now, actually did a poll of meteorologists and climatologists and asked them the correct question. And effectively, the answer was about 50% of their, of their membership said they thought it was more human-induced than natural, and about 50% said it was more naturally induced than human. So you can't get much more of a, of a disagreement among scientists than a 50-50 split. But that's, of course, not what you hear because we want to agree that the science is subtle. The problem is that's not the way science works. Science is never simply settled because everybody agrees that way. I mean, if that were the case, the atom would look like a microcosm of the solar system. We know it doesn't. But at one point, we all believed that way. We also believed um, you know, that the Earth was at the center of the solar system and that the sun and all the planets and the moon revolved around the earth. We know that's not the case, but that was the way science thought. So consensus doesn't make it true, but yet that's not how science is developed because even things we think are settled, like say gravity, now is coming under question. Maybe gravity isn't a force, maybe it's a warping of space time and our model of gravity works for most things, but it really doesn't work when you start to look at uh, uh, interplanetary astrophysics and it really doesn't work on subatomic scale levels. So there is a loss in, in gravity, and scientists are saying, well, maybe we need another model for it too. Well, I, can I, if you don't mind, Kim, if I sort of follow up here, I'm, I'm fascinated because there's so much that's implied, and then there's things that are baldly spoken, they're just stated, you know, the, uh, the, the ocean will collapse the coral reefs are dying, the polar ice caps will melt, the polar bears are all gonna die. We're gonna have more land falling hurricanes, there'll be more forest fires. And if you just go right down the list and look at the record uh, over any reasonable period of time, you see that they're fail, 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 at all these predictions. Yeah. So let's ask this UFO question a little bit differently. Do we have evidence that anthropogenic climate, climate uh, change or global warming, whatever the, you know, because you can pick your pick your poison about change, right? Climate 
Well, global warming means that places will be colder, it turns out, in some of the things that I've read, not in your book. Do we have reasonable um, evidence to believe that suggests that anthropogenic climate, climate change will be catastrophic? Okay, I'm going to date myself. When I got, when I was coming out of high school, getting interested, it was late 1970s, and it was all this discussion about climate but it was global cooling. The world was essentially getting colder and colder. We're probably headed in the next ice age. This is going to be devastating. And I remember a, an article from Newsweek, and the subtitle was essentially, uh, scientists believe that it's going to lead to more hurricanes, more floods, more droughts, and more tornadic events. So back then, global cooling was going to create more disaster. Now what we have is global warming, the exact opposite sign. And that, too, is going to create more disaster. The only way both of those could be true is if we were in some form of saddle point where we were at, like, the perfect climate and any change from that climate is going to be a problem. There's no indication that's the case. So the question is, which is it? Does a warmer world create more variability and hence more of all these disasters, or is it a colder world that does that? So the first thing we have to think of is why do we have, let's say, thunderstorms major thunderstorms on the uh, uh, in the Great Plain. I mean, here we are in April. Uh, April, May is generally when thunderstorm season, tornado season kicks up. Why does that happen? Because what happens is you have cold, warm air near the surface as the surface is eating. You have cold air aloft. So you have the potential for rising motion. You then have a lot of cold air coming in from Canada, and you have warm, moist air coming in from the Gulf. So what you can see is temperature contrast, temperature decrease with height, and a temperature decrease as you go poleward, okay? So what happens under a warmer world? Well, in a warmer world, we can warm the equator area slightly, but it's very difficult to warm warm air that's got a lot of moisture in it. So it's very difficult to change the temperature of the equatorial region. The polar regions, we're always told, will warm considerably. And that's true. And there's about six reasons why that happens. I won't go into all detail. But essentially what happens is because you have limited water vapor in the atmosphere, because you have cold air to begin with, and because you have a high pressure system, all of these come together to mean it's far easier to warm the polar regions, cold air, than it is to warm warm tropical moist air. So what that says is under a warmer world, your equator to pole temperature gradient decreases. So if you decrease the equator to pole temperature gradient, you're going to have less of a temperature difference between the warm tropical air coming in off the Gulf and what was colder air, but now is warmer air coming out of Cal uh, Canada. The, the loss of that contrasting air mass temperature difference leads to less rising motion, less violent motion. It leads to less tornadoes. We're actually seeing more tornadoes, but for a different reason. We're seeing more tornadoes because now we have weather radar. So a small tornado that appears in a Kansas wheat field probably would never have been seen in the 1950s, but now it's picked up on Doppler weather radar and we saw it. So if you adjust for that and look, for example, at the EF3, EF4, EF5, the big ones that probably wouldn't have been missed, we see actually there's a slight decrease in intensive hurricane, or excuse me, intensive tornadic activity. And that's simply because of that decrease between the warm air in the tropics and the cold air in polar regions and that temperature contrast. So the correct answer to the question is colder conditions lead to more variability, warmer conditions would lead to less variability. As another example, take the extreme. Let's say we move the pole and the equator to exactly the same temperature. What kind of global circulation would we have? We would have air moving up and down valleys. We would have air moving in and on the coast, sea breeze, land breeze. But our global circulation of westerlies, tropical easterlies, all will disappear because they're driven because of that polar equator temperature gradient. Now, I'm not saying we're going to an, uh, a homeo or a, a temperature gradient that's zero between the equator and the pole. But what I am saying is that warmer conditions in the polar regions leads to a relaxed gradient, which leads to less violent storms and less variability. 
Well, again, I, I, we want to get Walt in here for sure, but I just, as it always fascinates me, i fascinated by the whole thing. So who, who came up with the idea, popularized the idea that more CO2 in the atmosphere would lead to plant death and the failure of agriculture? I, well, well, that that's a stretch. Um, generally, the argument is that if you went into any commercial greenhouse, you'd see a little box in the corner, and that little box produces carbon dioxide. So why would they do that? Because as Sherwood Itso has shown, and if I had slides, I'd show you, it, it, he grew trees in different carbon dioxide concentrations. And the higher the carbon dioxide concentration, the faster the trees grow. Now, if you're in a commercial greenhouse, what do you want to do? You want to take seedlings and get them to a reasonable size so you can sell them as fast as possible. Carbon dioxide helps that. It's plant food. When you think of the photosynthesis process, you need carbon dioxide to run it. If you, if you starve the plant of carbon dioxide, it simply couldn't develop. So give it more carbon dioxide, it would develop. So the idea is carbon dioxide is plant food. It's not going to kill plants. What we have started to do is to say that one of the greenhouse gases that's destroying the planet is nitrous oxide. Nitrous oxide largely comes from uh, fertilizer. So particularly, they started to say uh, in Canada, in the Netherlands, we want to start reducing the amount of fertilizer. Now, if you take that to a logical extreme, if you cut down the amount of fertilizer used, you cut down the production, you cut down the food, either the cost of food goes up or the availability of food goes down. Sri Lanka actually did that, said we're going a couple of years ago, we are not going to have fertilizer, so we're going to save the nitri nitrous oxide going into the atmosphere. And what happened is they had a self-imposed famine. So the idea is that more carbon dioxide is simply plant food, plants grow better, and almost anything you try to do to stop the planet from warming is going to hurt plants as well as humans. Well, and I'm just so concerned about this, Dr. Legates, that if we continue down this road, as you just alluded to, that the price of food is going to go up, but the availability may decrease as well. And I don't you remember, we used to have in the backs of magazines, uh, help feed the world, uh, help solve world hunger. Those were things that were noble causes. And now we see, seem to have those that are on a trajectory where people would starve. And that's, that is to be scary because if, if you think about what happened is back in the 1800s, we had about 90% of the population living below the poverty level, attempting, you know, subsidence living and about 10% above. If we jump to 2020, it's about the exact opposite. About 90% of the global population lives above the poverty level and about 10% lives below the poverty level. How did we go from 90% below the poverty level to 90% above the poverty level? And the answer was essentially inexpensive energy. The development of natural gas, oil, and so forth made energy inexpensive so that virtually most people could afford it. If you can afford energy, you can heat your home, you can cook with it. Uh, right now, for example, people in Africa have air quality problems because they're cooking indoors with a combination of dung and uh, biomass, and it creates terrible pollution inside. If you could stop using that and get to a little a cleaner fuel that would be would not produce as much particulate and air pollution, it would generally enhance their air quality, it would enhance their, their life and their livability. And those are the kinds of things that if we're going to be good stewards of our environment and good stewards of others, that we really should be focusing on. Uh, the other issue is technological development is has played a key role. If we go from the 1960s to 2020, the amount of food produced by a given acre of crop has gone up by about a factor of three. So the same amount of land now can produce more food to feed more people. And that's also a good thing. But my concern is if you make energy more expensive, if we start using food for uh, biomass uh, energy sources, if we start making food and energy ex expensive, people won't be able to, to feed themselves. We'll start to put people behind that poverty curve 
we start to kill people and starve them, and we'll be back to the 1800s. Well, and Walt, I know that uh, the whole fertilizer issue is uh, very important to you, and I know you're considering maybe a sequel to a climate conversation on that. Um, you know, what's your thoughts about this? I, I agree wholeheartedly. Let me pitch in on one other thing. I had at least 10 people contact me this week saying they wanted to hear from a real climatologist. And we finally got one. Uh, Dr. Legates here is, is one of the very first people to graduate with a PhD in climatology. And we won't say how long ago, but that was one of the first schools that had one, the University of Delaware, if I'm right. Yeah. And, and, and so this all fits together with what I thought for a long time, that if we did away with if we did away with fossil fuel, we would do away with fertilizer because it's made from fer uh, from fossil fuels. And, and if we do away with fertilizer, which people some people want to do altogether anyway, we're, we're going to have to have a, our, our planet will support, I think, about two billion population, maybe three. But who is going to determine which are the people that we're going to have to kill that are, are going to die in this? And, and that's where I'm having trouble is we're, we're making knee-jerk decisions based on emotions, and we're not sitting down to add the cost, both for humans and, and cost uh, financially to do it. That's just my take. And that's what motivated me enough to, to reach into my retirement uh, plan and, and say, I got to make a movie. It, it, I was driven to do that. Well, Walt, there's plenty of positive emotion that's available in this book, in this, I think, incredibly important new book. Because there's a there is a chapter um, on UN modeling that forecasts the the growth of the 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 global net worth, and even under the lowest expectations, we're looking at a vastly richer planet by the year 2100, vastly richer, and even under even under dramatically you know and probably manipulated models that show significant temperature rises, we're looking at a very small diminution of that. And that coming after compounding has, has happened. So Dr. Gates, can you talk to us generally about the danger of energy transitions like this from very high density energy sources to very low density energy sources and from reliable energy sources that have that 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 um, you know the built-in uh, lasting effect. I can't, you know, I'm not the scientist here, but there's a there's a lasting effect associated with uh, with you know hydrocarbon-based energy versus wind and solar. Which when the cloud when the sun eclipses, there goes the solar you know radiation. Well, see, that's been the problem with a number of states, including Delaware, where I happen to be right now. We've uh, signed on a bill that's going to take us to net zero by 2050. Net zero physically means we will not produce more carbon dioxide than we're removing from the atmosphere. And the way to do that is going to be to gut effectively all of our sources of fossil fuels and everything based on them. So we're going to an electric vehicle mandate, an electric bus mandate. I'm seeing now a potential for uh, getting trains to run on electricity and I don't mean the third rail or the overhead. They want big, big uh, uh, batteries on board trains. They also want offshore wind and they want to turn all of our farmland into what I call solar factories. Now, the question you have to ask is where does all these, excuse me, where does all the material come from to create solar panels, to create wind turbines and to create batteries? Well, they're called rare earth, and Walt will know better than I would. They're called rare earth minerals. And it's for not necessarily, sorry? For a reason they're called rare earth For a reason, yeah. And the issue is they don't exist in seams like coal or copper or gold. Rather, they exist all over the place. So what you really have to do is you have to do strip mining. You go in, you take out large portions of soil, you put it into a, a slurry with toxic chemicals. They come out of solution. And then you dump the toxic chemicals and do this over again. In the United States, we said, we can't do this. It creates too much disaster to the environment. It creates too much toxicity. It destroys the landscape. 
We can't do that. In Africa, though, in Congo in particular, they're doing it. They're doing it in Southeast Asia. And in, in Southeast Asia, a lot of the work is coming from people that are being uh, forced labor, slave labor. In the Congo, it's coming from a lot of children that are being forced to sit in these uh, in these slurries and sort through and to pull the, the sedimentation out. The, the problem with that is you're destroying the environment. So everybody thinks, you know, wind and solar are clean and green. You see a tur spinning wind turbine or you see a solar panel sitting there absorbing energy. And that's a clean, green type of energy source, except to get all that material out, to get that material to the location, to build the, the to build the stuff is environmentally unfriendly of the of the nth degree it takes an awful lot of space so if you're going to have lots of solar farms around you're going to have to get rid of the real farms and so delaware for example will produce a lot less food simply because we will have solar panels where we had cornfields before um, and this is happening all over the country iowa's i've seen uh, discussions there too a lot of countries are going or excuse me states are going this way it's going to create a serious problem for food supplies, for everything else. And we're told this is the future because it's clean and green and it is nothing of the kind. Dr. Legate, you mentioned one other thing that uh, I really learned when we were doing the work on the documentary, A Climate Conversation. And you mentioned the slave labor that is occurring with children in the Congo. And uh, there's this whole narrative regarding the history of America and slavery. And, and certainly um, we acknowledge that that was, was not a, you know, not, not the, the founding, this idea that all men are created equal with these rights from God, life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. But America has, has gone to um, a war uh, conversation to slavery is not, is not okay here. Um, and so those that are, talking about the slavery narrative, let's have an honest conversation. If we really are concerned about slavery, we need to be concerned about these children in the Congo, these, uh, uh, these people in Asia. We need to be concerned about that in 2024, our 2024 world. I mean, you, you would definitely be assumed that, assume that that would be on most people's radar screens, that they'd be concerned of it. And I had a, a podcast person say to me, uh, I never see the mainstream media runs stories on this. And I sent him, I think it was just off the top of my head on a quick Google search from all these leftist organizations where they actually have run this. But it never seems to gain traction in the environmental area. You can see children in areas where it's just, I'd say mud, but it's not mud. It's, it's toxic waste that they're wading in to get this stuff. And it doesn't seem to ever be on their radar screen. Uh, you mentioned slavery, too. The question is, one of the reasons, why is it possible that we could get rid of slavery? I mean, there was no way to run large farms without having some form of energy. And the easiest energy were animals or humans. Animals are sort of dumb. They'll walk right through what they just created and tear it all up. Humans know a little better, can be trained to be a little bit better. Unfortunately, we're going to have to make them slaves. But what allowed all that was technological development that came from cheap energy. So you had energy that allowed people to develop technology. Technology comes along, develops things. Now we don't need as many people to produce the same amount of crop, to do, do the same amount of cotton production. We don't need all that physical labor. So therefore, slavery becomes less needed, and we can therefore get rid of slavery, which for most of the world we have, but unfortunately, not everyone. Boy, that's a really interesting point. Uh, one of the things that I've realized is reliable, efficient, affordable, and abundant energy actually allows everyday people to fuel their dreams and go after, you know, after their, you know, their prosperity. Yeah. Thomas Edison once had a cub reporter come. He, he had a brand new job and his first assignment was to write up about this uh, power plant that Edison built. And he said, how do I make it interesting? And Edison sat down, and it wasn't that far from slavery, sat down and calculated this power plant replaces all the energy of the slaves. Wow. 
that one power plant. And that's, that was less than a generation from, from slavery. Yep. Wow. But think, we make energy more expensive. We make energy less available. The problem we're going to do is we're going to make it so that most people can't do that. We're going to have to go back in the way in which we live. And I'm afraid in some places, if we don't value human life, that people will be put into slavery. Certain children will be forced into child labor. You know, we go back in time when we have, we thought we left all that behind. We developed what it seems like is we want to go back to those days. And that's not where we should be. No, totally agree. Dave, your thoughts? Well, this is the 800 pound gorilla, I think, in the entire conversation, which is the underlying motivation. And I think your chapters in the book, there's chapter, there's a chapter, I wrote, I made a note from uh, BJ Jayaraj mm -hmm. about the sort of the energy policy in the developing world. And it, it's moving. It's written scientifically, but it, it might get you. And he lives in India. So he's, he's living it out even as he speaks, as he writes. Yeah. So that the whole, this whole noble savage concept of not allowing the developing world to become uh to benefit from energy which is just simply producing work right and i think it's also in the book that there's the good definition for energy is 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 creating work so uh, we want them not to have that work and yet to benefit from um, global wealth and so there's so many ironies here because yeah. The wealth produced the wealth production that's come from the the development of energy resources is explains everything explains longevity and the assumption was always that the noble native is living at one with the environment that that's the way we really all should be living is you know back to eden as we could get essentially and but they didn't they had you know, 14, 15 children. Why? Because 12 to 13 of them are probably not going to make it to, to childbearing age. So if you want to keep having more enough humans and to keep moving, you've got to have lots of kids because they're just going to die off. Well, what happened was the, the concern in the 1970s when Earth Day started is Paul Ehrlich comes along and says, we got too many people. And if we start doing things that are going to increase their longevity, we're going to be overrun with humans. And so we're not going to have enough food to put to humans, therefore, are bad. And he came up with what is called now the uh, Ehrlich-Holdren equation. Holdren was um, the head of Office in Science Technology Policy under uh, Biden, excuse me, under, under Obama. And that equation is real simple. It just says I equals P-A-T. Okay, so I is your uh, environmental uh, inf uh, impact. And it's always bad. And it's driven by three factors. P, population, A, affluency, and T, technology. So if you think about that equation, what it says is to minimize our environmental impact, we need to cut down on the population. And those that we do have need to be living in technological squalor in essentially a subsidence uh, near poverty condition. So developing a, a civilization with more technology, to develop a civilization that has a, a larger growing population, and to develop a civilization that's moving itself out of poverty is always going to create an environmental impact. And to those people, that's terrible. So that's another reason humans are bad. We need to keep them at a minimum. And the ones that we do allow to remain have to be kept technologically disadvantaged and kept essentially poor. That's not the way we, you know, we, we look at people and say, this is how we need to help people by a killing them off and b keeping those in poor state that, I mean, but this is, this is the viewpoint. And I think this underlies a lot of other things, why human life starts to become less, less uh, championed, particularly from birth to death. The idea is you know, human life is sacred. It represents God. It, you know, we want to take care of others. But at the same time, these people sort of see humans as evil consumers using resources on the planet, destroying it for other life forms. And if we can just limit the number of people, that would be a good thing. I, I, I just can't, 
I can't find a, 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 a common ground with those people. Well, Dr. LaGates, the question is, who is the we that's uh, trying to make these decisions? They are the environmentalists. Those that think, you know, the, the people in power, um, they, they generally tend to be, um, how can I say, co- uh, socialist type. Um, I mean, I saw somewhere where one of the, the worst evil that on the planet was the, um, the ability to uh, have a, a free market economy. Uh, essentially, they, the, the assumption is these people know more than everybody else. They will dictate how things are to be done. They will take the resources we have and apportion it appropriately. They will be in control. You will be the masses. You will go along with it. Um, and it, it becomes one of control. And that's the chapter in the book that I talk about how all this started. Most people assume that climate change got started because we looked at the environment. We said, my goodness, there's more hurricanes, there's more floods, there's more droughts. We've got to stop all these things from happening. Uh, scientists looked into it and says it's because it's a warmer world. Why is the world warming? Oh, well, it's fossil fuels and carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And so, therefore, their conclusion was we, we've got to change the way we're doing it. It's the same thing. If you looked at Love Canal and said, why are we polluting the environment? Well, we've got to come up with a way to stop putting PCBs into the environment and things. That makes sense because it does follow. This doesn't make sense because that's not how it followed. It wasn't that we saw all these things happening. We said it's because of this we've got to solve the problem. It's because how do we get a a socialism essentially to work on a global scale? You can force it at a a, a, uh, scale of a given country. You can take those people that have and say, you stole from the have-nots. You have to give back. And therefore, we come in as the overlord totalitarians and we equal everything out to each according to his ability, each according to his need. And we decide how things should be. How do you do that from the U.N. perspective? You need something to go into each state, each country that's producing more than others, that has developed more than others, and say the reason you are advanced and they're not is because you stole from them. You have to give your money and your receipts back to them to make them better. Now, we can't allow them to become developed because if we did, they would just be in the same boat. So we have to try to kick these people down by taking from them. And how do you do that with a developed world is by saying, you are destroying the environment that's going to keep all of us alive. You, therefore, have to pay for it. And that's how this all got started, essentially, in a wealth redistribution on a global scale so that developed world, developed countries, developed people had to give money back to a general fund, the UN, so they could equalize out the money and they could decide to each according to his or her need and to each according to his or her ability. Even though we both know that phrase never works in practice. If if I could just, uh, so this book has to be read. If you're watching this podcast, get this book. We're, we're, we'll have a Chiron here to show you how to do it. Do it today. Get this book. Read this book. Um, As it says, if you if you go to the Cornwall Alliance, which is cornwallalliance.org, um, and for you know if you donate to us and then just ask for a free copy of the book, we'll send it to you. And uh, we are a five hundred one c three organization, so any donation you give to us, uh, hopefully you you see that you would agree with us. Uh, and any donation you would give would be tax deductible. I don't think you can get that from Amazon. <laughs> we would love for you to tell us more about the, the work at the Cornwall Alliance, but but I just want to make one comment because the, the story of the UN's role in this and certain American, uh, American individuals have played a very significant role in all this, but eco-socialism requires a crisis requires it just like any other critical thinking idea right it could be a crisis crisis of racism it could be a a crisis of capitalism this is a crisis of climate but it's not about climate i thought it was interesting because everybody thinks Rahm emmanuel was the first person who came up with this phrase never let a crisis go to waste but he got it from saul alinsky in rules for radicals in 1971. alinsky stole it from machiavelli and Machiavelli is a good person to turn to for a primer on how the UN operates, it seems to me. 
And what Americans should remember is that America is the prince <laughs> in the Machiavellian story, right? Yeah. The UN is set against America and, and Americanism. Is that me? I hope that's not me. Yeah. I apologize for that. I thought I had that turned on. Okay. Oh, so can you tell us a little bit about, if you have any remarks about that, Machiavellianism at the UN, we'd love to hear it, but also the Cornwall. Well, I would also encourage everyone actually to read through Saul Alinsky's Rules for Radicals. It is not the way you should live. There are a number of people have written books, uh, Rules for Patriots. Uh, I read one by Steve Dace, and I thought that was excellent. Um, but this is not for how we should play the game, but it's how they play the game. And if, if you if you go through there, you'll see things like blame the other side for exactly what you're doing. See, the assumption is always, well, why why is David Legate saying all this stuff? Well, it's because he's bought off by oil and gas interests who put tons of money into fostering this viewpoint. They don't. What happens is if the federal government puts tons of money into funding people to come out and say climate change is a disaster on the horizon and we need to do things. In fact, the federal government gave money to the Rockefeller Foundation, I think it was, that went out and gave money to a number of um, leftist news organizations so they could hire climate change reporters to write stories on how bad climate change is and how we need legislation to stop it. So in other words, these are not journalists who are sitting down independent and saying, let me write on something. Your money comes specifically to write about stories that are biased in a particular viewpoint. And so a lot of people don't understand that this is not a fair game on, on either side, that one side has their uh, proponents who fund them, the other side is their proponents, and it's whoever had more money wins today. It's no, it's it's all the money is going the other direction. There's very little support on this side, but all the facts are on our side. And my argument is the facts out trump this in the long run, because I still think people will be smart enough to see the difference when they when when shown the evidence, they will make the right choice. And that's why I'm doing this, even though, you know, Exxon doesn't give me millions of dollars. If they want to, that would be great. But I, I don't see that about to happen. Well, well that, was Walt, a, that was, of course, the underlying motivation for Walt yeah. was to find a way or find add a way to uh, pull some weight against this. You, you you really would start to think that when every dire claim has been shown to be untrue, at least thus far. Yeah. So, Seas aren't rising, ice isn't melting, the polar bears are thriving. <laughs> there are fewer hurricanes. The forest fires yeah. there are from stupidity and 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 not from uh, atmospheric effects. And what? this is a critical thing that doubling CO2 is not equal to doubling temperature. Right? That that oh. and you talk about this at some, to some great effect in your book is the sort of diminishing marginal impact of increased CO2. That, that you know, the, the huge amount of, of CO2's effects on global warming has already happened. And if you can help us understand that, because that is complicated. Yeah, the, one of the examples I often use is, imagine you've got a, a black wall in a house and you go in with some whitewash and you put over it. The first coat of whitewash has the biggest impact. The second coat has a little bit more, a little bit, or makes it a little whiter, but not as white as it did at the beginning because it's now not as black as it was before. And as you keep putting layer of layer of layer of whitewash on it, the amount of the next layer is less of an impact of changing the color. It's the same thing with carbon dioxide. If there were no carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, the first molecules that go in would absorb a lot of energy. Now we're getting to the point where we've got lots of molecules in the atmosphere. They've absorbed most of the bands in which there's absorption taking place. So that by putting more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, there's just simply less and less energy in the thermal bands that it absorbs for it to be able to increase the temperature. And so uh, while 
going from say zero to 280 parts per million got us a rise of about 30 degrees Celsius. The doubling that is not going to get you 30 more. It's going to get you about one because it's a diminishing effect. And the same thing with it's happening on the side of the building is the same things happening in the atmosphere. More carbon dioxide has a diminishing effect because they're all competing with each other. And once a limited amount of that energy or most of that energy has been absorbed, there's a whole lot less that can be absorbed. The other thing people forget is that the most important greenhouse gas is not carbon dioxide, is not um, methane, it's not nitrous oxide, it's water vapor. And this is one of the issues that came up. I was testifying in Congress with Michael Mann and Willie Soon. And uh, Senator Jeffords, who was leading the, the discussion, actually asked Mann, why are we, if, if water vapor is the most important greenhouse gas, why are we legislating carbon dioxide? And I knew what his answer probably should have been, that carbon dioxide has a longer lifespan, that precipitation wise, we precipitate out the atmosphere in about eight to 10 days. So water vapor doesn't stay in the atmosphere very long. Carbon dioxide stays longer. I may not agree with that argument, but I see that's the argument he's gonna make. That wasn't the argument he made. What he simply said was, we can't legislate water vapor. <laughs> so you can legislate carbon dioxide and therefore you will, but you can't keep people from putting water vapor in the atmosphere. I, you know, I mean, it, it gets to the point where when when pushed, they make mistakes. They say what exactly what they think. And there, there's a part in the book um, in chapter two that I wrote talking about how people now that are economists are saying that, you know, all these climate change meetings, uh, COP40 and so forth, when they get together to discuss climate change, this really has nothing to do with climate change anymore. And they're the ones saying this. This is not about climate change. This is about the way to de facto change the global economy. How do we move from a free market system to a globally controlled, centralized car, uh, system? Uh, and it's amazing that you know they think they're winning, so they'll let their guard down and say just what they think. And that goes back to you know if you read Saul Alinsky's Rules for Radicals, you know they get a little too cocky at times. And just listen to what they say listen to what they tell you, you'll learn an awful lot. There are a number of things that are in this, again, yeah. wonderful book. I, I just want to read one of them because it really struck me it, I, just, that someone said this aloud. Mm -hmm. And here's the quote. One has to free oneself from the illusion that international climate policy is environmental policy. This has almost nothing to do with environmental policy anymore. Yeah. So, well, what's it for? Well, <laughs> you know. as I said, how do you enact a global socialist economy? You've got to have a way in which you take and attack those that have and support those that have not. And so we can come to the those that have and say, you've disrupted the environment. You have to pay for that. And that's where we are. It's not a good place to be. I mean, you look at the Green New Deal. I mean, um, AOC's uh, chief of staff said, you think of the Green New Deal as an, as an environmental topic? We thought it was an economic issue. Of course. So, Dr. LeGates, looking forward into the future, the veil is coming off. However, there's billions of dollars that's being, government dollars that's being pushed uh, into this agenda. There's a lot of people living off of this narrative. Uh, so. Moving into the future, what do you see? I am generally a pessimist by nature. There's two reasons for that. One is if it does come about, I've already planned for it. And if it doesn't come about, then I'm pleasantly surprised. Um, but I'm not a fatalist. Um, so I think it's going to take another, probably another uh, uh, generation before we finally start to see the issue. Now, a lot of people are telling me, as you just did, that that they see people around the country coming alive and realizing that, you know, I can only tell you that the sky is falling for so long. And when it doesn't fall after some point, you start to say, you know, I've been had, you're playing me for a fool. And I'm hoping we're getting there sooner than later. 
the the problem is if you if you ever heard the story of Trofim Lysenko, Lysenko was a um, uh, a Soviet uh, uh, peasant, and he came up with this weird idea that if you take seeds and you put them in the freezer and you leave them in the freezer for a while and then you take them out and you put them in the ground, they actually grow better in colder conditions. Now, this lies in the face of Mendel's uh, genetics and they knew this, but Mendel was not a Soviet and this was a great way for Stalin to say, see what little peasants can do when the big minds are coming up with other ideas. But they took it to a logical extreme or an illogical extreme. And the illogical extreme is that no one can teach genetics in the Soviet Union. So those that were geneticists were either chased out of town, were ostracized, or worse yet, killed. So no one was learning about genetics. And agriculture was developing along the ideas of, you know, uh, if you take a plant and you pluck off all its leaves, it'll put more leaves out. So you keep doing that. Eventually, its offspring spring will grow without leaves. Now, if you stop and think about that for a moment, how are the offspring ever going to grow? If they don't have leaves to produce the photosynthesis, they should be dead because a tree without leaves, we usually look at and say it's dead. But this was the idea is that these kinds of weird concepts were being dri were driving agriculture and things that were developing on the outside, uh, such as genetics, were you can't do this. And it wasn't until I think it was 64 when I um, can't remember which Soviet uh, premier, came, premier came in and said, you know, we're finally going to we're going to have to give this up because our agriculture is so far behind. We can't feed our own people. Um, so we're going to start to allow uh, the study of genetics uh, in, in our agriculture. I think at some point we're going to come to that realization. I hope it takes a whole lot longer than it did in the Soviet Union. But I hope that sometime along the line, somebody with common sense says, you know, the planet isn't getting worse. You could tell us it is. It's not. We need to come along and we're destroying our economy to do so. And maybe with this concept of net zero, maybe when you find out you can't buy a gasoline powered car anymore, when you find out your energy has gone through the roof. I mean, right now in Delaware, you cannot build a new building and have natural gas connections. That's forbidden. Every new building must have at least a 240 volt connection uh, built into it to be able to house a electric recharger for cars. Um, doesn't have to have the recharger yet, but you have to have the, the 240 volt in. That's going to be expensive, not just for houses. It's expensive for uh, apartments because apartments are done the same way. You keep putting this on people, and I'm hoping down the line, earlier than later, sooner than later, they finally realize we've got to stop this and they start to revolt and it may result in another civil war. I don't know, but hopefully we, the, the politicians at that point will run, run for the Hills and we'll be able to take back control and get rid of some of this illogic, illogical stuff that's going on and come back to common sense. Well, Dr. Legace, that's why your book, Climate and Energy, The Case for Realism is so important. And Walt Johnson, that's why your vision for the documentary, A Climate Conversation, and also these podcasts are so important as well. So what's the final thought that you'd like to leave with us, Walt? Well, I've enjoyed this very much. And as, as in, our, in our movie, Ken Gregory was probably the first person to try to calculate the cost of going to net zero. And that hasn't really sunk in yet. But we also, in later podcasts, went into what is the cost of, of recycling or doing away with the hazardous waste from this. No, no one is talking about that yet. So, so we have a lot to discuss yet. But uh, thank you very much, Dr. Legates. I, I sure appreciate your input. And, uh, and thank you, and thank you for the work you've done. And since you, you are affiliated with the CO2 coalition also, aren't you? Yes, yes. And it was the CO2 coalition that uh, was doing some calculation on, on uh, the uh, isotopes of carbon, weren't they? Or some people have had feedback recently from a 
a, a scientist even, who said, well, I enjoyed the movie, but I know about the isotopes now. And so I looked into a little more and the isotopes of carbon, uh, uh, car C12 and I think C16 carbon do something about this, the uh, temperatures. But uh, some people are saying this is the new hockey stick, maybe a, an indicator we got to do something. It, what do you have any insight on, on the isotopes? Uh, I don't. I do have a lot of insight on the hockey stick, having uh, fought this out uh, in Congress a number of years ago. Um, the hockey stick was contrived from the beginning. There was a discussion that went around that said the, one of the problems we keep coming up against is that geologic history, we see that there was a medieval warm period and a little ice age. And when you look at carbon dioxide, the medieval warm period, the temperature went up, but carbon dioxide didn't change. How do we make the argument that carbon dioxide is that climate control knob when temperature changed, but carbon dioxide didn't? And the answer, of course, was we have to make the medieval warm period go away. And by the next uh, IPCC assessment, Michael Mann had come out with the hockey stick graph, which we now know to be bad science, uh, to be bad, um, bad statistics, and all around just simply not the way the world works. But instead, uh, it gave the impression that climate didn't change for 900 years. And then over the last 100 years, uh, it's all of a sudden shot up. And um, temperature, I should say. And uh, it works to sell the message until you realize it was all fabricated. And that's hopefully one thing that CO2 Coalition, our book, Cornwall Alliance, and all of us are trying to get across, is that that's not the truth. And the truth is the most important thing in every discussion, particularly this one. Thank you, Don. Well, Dave, how do you want to wrap all this up? Because I know gratitude. that... For, for Walt, for the beautiful movie that you've made, for your friendship and your leadership, Kim, and Dr. Lee Gates, for this remarkable opportunity for a lay person like me to get to talk to someone who has walked the walk for 30 years and really does actually know what he's talking about and has taken the time and effort with with contributions from many others to create what I think is the most useful book on this topic that's been created. Well, I've recently retired from the university and I was glad I did because as you probably aware, the university is becoming the bastion of the extreme left and, and the, the quest for knowledge and truth is no longer found in most universities around the country. Um, but I'm glad for podcasts like yours and hopefully the more people watch, the more people learn these kinds of things. They start to do their own research uh, and start to understand what's going on and that this isn't a 97 versus 3 argument. This is probably, if it's 97 versus 3, it's 97% of realists versus the 3% of uh, uh, activists that just have a louder voice. Well, uh, Dr. LeGates, thank you so much. Dave O'Rourke, spokesperson for Climate Conversation. Awesome, as always. Walt Johnson, thank, thank you. you. Thank you for thank caring. You. And thank, thank you for you. stepping forward, making this happen. Thank you. So thank be you, sure Dave. to check out at climateconversation.com. And thanks to all of you. Thank you. <laughs>